and solid. Solids are the least mobile form of matter, gases, liquids, and solids. So once the material is turned into a solid, it's an inanimate object, it has no energy on its own, it's very unlikely to move by itself. Once that material is converted to a stable solid, the viewpoint is to put it in the ground in a geologic formation which has a good hydrologic uh, characteristic and there it will stay for a very long period of time. Geologic formations in the United States are known to have been stable for as much as 500 million to a billion years. The Yucca Mountain site has been in place for roughly 12 million years. There is varying viewpoints about how long that site has to be stable. On the short end of it, some people believe 10,000 years. On the long end of it, some people believe a million years. There is no consensus at the present time. The EPA standard to which we're working, which is the most conservative standard written by man, talks about a 10,000 year time frame. So we believe once the radioactive waste is converted into a solid and put somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 feet below the surface, there is very little chance that it will return to man's environment on its own. The primary purpose of the site characterization effort is to evaluate that site, to assure ourselves of its stability and the low possibility that that material will never come back to man's environment. Now the Nevada test site was considered beginning back in 1977. It was a site owned by the Department of Energy on which radioactive uh, on which radioactive material was contained and would be there for a long period of time. It was a piece of land that the department felt would not be turned back to the public domain as long as there was organized government in the United States. <coughs> it also had a cadre of people that had a great deal of experience in operating with nuclear materials and could be available for operation of a repository if one was designed. So those are some of the institutional reasons why the Nevada test site was considered. Some of the technical reasons were is the fact is that we're in a closed hydrologic basin. That means the water that falls on that area flows to the center, does not discharge into any major body of water that goes to the sea. The central part of that closed hydrologic basin is Death Valley. The amount of water that is present from rainfall is very small. The Eastern Mojave Desert is one of the most arid places in the United States, accounting for about six inches of rainfall per year. The distance between where the repository would be and any potential discharge point of water on the surface is very long, with very long groundwater travel times. So if the water radioactive waste were ever to get into the water, it would take a very long time before it would show up in man's environment again. There was a potential that the water table was very deep and if possible that we could build a repository in what is known as the unsaturated zone. People that are familiar with wells is below the sat in the in the saturated zone below the water table the water will pool will come to rest in a hole. Above the unsat above that water table in the unsaturated zone there is still some free water but it's a very small amount and it is moving very slowly. The materials in which were in the western United States, and particularly Yucca Mountains, we came to find out, were known as zeolites. That means they're much like the materials you find in water softeners and are capable of reacting with the radionuclides to take them out of the water if the radionuclides were ever to get in. So those were some of the major factors that made the Nevada test site in Yucca Mountain an attractive place for putting the radioactive waste. Now in terms of some of the negative aspects of the, the site is that the water in the uh, saturated zone does move rapidly in the context of um, geologic times. So the time frame between Yucca Mountain, say the major discharge point, is 20,000 years. That seems long by a human lifetime, but in geologic times it is somewhat short. Another concern is, is whether or not the tectonic setting is right. That means the seismicity. The ground motion that's liable to occur from an earthquake, whether or not that is sufficient to cause damage to surface facilities. More likely, the, the uh, ground motion associated with an earthquake would not produce any significant effect on underground facilities. It may knock 
loose a few rocks in the ceiling and so on, but it would have no significant impact in terms of the isolation capability of the site. So the other, say, a social or institutional question is the fact is that the, tra the transportation routes between where the reactors would be or the waste is in predominantly eastern part of the United States would be the longest to either Nevada or Hanford. So that's one of the, uh, what you might call a, a socioeconomic drawback. Now let me say that there are, in this discussion, identified about three major points that people have considered as major issues. The first one is transportation. They've identified because of the long travel or the distances between the reactors in a repository, this represents a major threat to the health and well-being of the public. We do not believe that that is a correct assumption or a rational situation. We've been shipping spent fuel in the United States for over 30 years. And never in that time has any of the radioactive material which has been transported in what is known as a type B cast gotten out into the environment. We know of no deaths that have occurred as a result of that. There are very stringent standards on which the packaging in which that spent fuel on is uh, transported, very stringent controls on those packages. So we believe that a transportation system <coughs> which does have the major impact uh, is, is an acceptable one. The um, environmental assessment shows something if we're shipping about 183,000 shipments of spent fuel by truck, we would see something like 76 deaths in a, over a 30 year period. 73 of those are results of normal traffic accidents where people would be killed based upon just having an interaction with a truck. There are only three of them that calculate out to be latent cancer deaths produced somewhere along the transport routes. Tourism is another consideration that's identified as a major point. People believe if we would transport large amounts of radioactive material through the state, it would cause people to look unfavorably upon the, the, the opportunity to spend a vacation in Nevada. I think there's substantial evidence to say that that might not be true. We know that a major activity conducted by the Department of Energy and its predecessors was the nuclear weapons testing. Beginning in 1951, January 1951, we started to set off more than 100 atmospheric tests and somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 low ground tests. In that time frame, Southern Nevada grew from a population of around 50,000 people to somewhere over 475,000 people. In the same time frame, the revenues from gaming in Clark County beginning in 1955 grew from about $61 million to $1.6 billion in 1980. So there's a steady increase in people coming to live in Nevada, in Southern Nevada, a steady increase in the gaming revenues from the tourists that indicates that while some other things that are much more significant in terms of impact, that is a detonation of a nuclear weapon, did not deter people from coming to this area for vacations or for living. So we believe that while this is a major concern of people, there is strong evidence to indicate that there is no cause and effect relationship. Socioeconomic impacts have been identified as a third major concern. What would happen if uh, a large number of people came to work on a construction project of building a repository? What would that impact have on the community? We've tried to identify those things and we've, we've looked at what the um, employment profiles would be during construction and during the operational period. We believe that the number of workers that would be there are relatively um, reasonable. They're less than what can currently work at the Nevada test site. Some 6,000 people work at the Nevada test site right now. We're looking at uh, a constant employment figure of somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2,000 people beginning in or for over a 30 year period of time in which the repository would operate. So in my 15 minutes what I've tried to do is give you some background in terms of the rationale why the Nevada test site was picked. It does have some drawbacks. No site in the United States is perfect. Uh, some reasons why disposal by geologic methods will be safe and protect the health and well-being of the public. 
and some of the major issues that have come up in the last uh, couple of years that we've been involved in it and our efforts of trying to address those issues. And so later on, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Bob? Thanks for the time. I expected you to carry on for a little while longer. I'd like to uh, take a couple minutes and, and uh, outline what at least uh, I've identified to, to talk about th this evening. Uh, I hadn't really splan uh, planned to spend a whole lot of time talking about the governor's position necessarily, although I can indicate to you that he is opposed to the project, uh, as has been two or three governors previous to him. Uh, I hadn't really planned to talk about organization, how we're organized to look at the issue other than to let you know that we have only began looking at some of the issues I'm going to talk about in earnest for the last couple of years, uh, previously uh, only in a superficial manner. So uh, I guess I'm going to raise concerns rather than, than talk specifically about things that we know that are going on at this point in time. I guess there's about five areas that I want to talk about briefly that, that we're generally concerned about. Uh, before I do that, I guess I'd like to indicate that, that generally uh, the first four of the issues are, are issues that generally seem to be one of national scope and magnitude, and the latter one deal primarily with the, with the site itself. We're concerned, uh, I guess, in, in two or three areas with, uh, first of all, the siting process, both its objectivity and, and uh, legality, uh, how we got to Yucca Mountain and, and where it is. I guess additionally we're concerned, as Don has indicated, with the transportation aspect of the uh, project in, in some, ex some extent. Uh, we have some concerns in the liability area. We have some growing concerns about the ability of the state to participate in this issue uh, as required by the law and some, and some concerns about how that goes forward. And lastly, as I said, some site-specific issues, both in the sort of technical area and the institutional area seems to me that, that there's been a couple of, of issues out there that have, uh, I think the public is, is somewhat generally been misled about. I think the first one is that, that Yucca Mountain is not on the Nevada test site. Uh, by the uh, own Department of Energy's environmental assessment, there is relatively little other than background radiation at Yucca Mountain itself. And the EA contemplates a land withdrawal of some 50,000 additional acres uh, to uh, seal off the area, uh, protect it from intruders for over a period of time. The rationale to go to federal sites to begin with stems from Congress and from the General Accounting Office uh, in directing the Department of Energy to look at the federal sites for three or four specific reasons. One is that those areas were owned by the Department of Energy already. Uh, secondly, there was quantities of high-level waste there already. And uh, thirdly, that those lands were generally contaminated. None of those conditions apparently are true about Yucca Mountain. Uh, I guess we're a little bit concerned about the process that we got to Yucca Mountain, the screening methodology that's, that's uh, at least I've tried to characterize on the board over there. I don't really want to go into any real detail about that at this point other than to indicate that it seems that Nevada and the Washington site, because of their federal land status, appear to be on a little faster track, not uh, involved in comparison with other sites as, as, as much as the other sites were. Uh, I guess I will back away from any, I guess, anything else in the siting process and, and deal with any other concerns you have and questions and answers. In the area of transportation, the major concern we have is, is twofold. One is that there seems to be a lack of planning and understanding of the issue and the public's concern with it. And it hasn't really been a tool to compare the attributes of sites. Uh, it hasn't been used to compare one site against another, uh, whether uh, there's less uh, hazard in shipping to a Mississippi site, for instance, as opposed to a Nevada site. Essential that uh, this is one of the elements in the entire program, I think, that go a long way in instilling public confidence in the ability of the Department of Energy to handle this uh, issue, uh, and I think it's, it's not being done, and one that, that a lot more could be done on. Again, in the liability issue, the uh, National Governors Association, the National Conference of State Legislators, and others have taken a position that the federal government ought to assume unlimited liability with regard to any accident that might occur in the waste uh, cycle from uh, receipt of waste to disposal and uh, its ultimate operation in a repository. And the Department of Energy has taken a position of, of some limited liability in that area. And again, I think by 
uh, t uh, assuming an unlimited liability position that they could go a long way to providing public confidence. The issue of state participation is one of which we've been concerned of recently. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act requires the Department of Energy to consult and cooperate with the states as well as provide grant monies. Uh, recently, we have uh, getting a, a limited uh, view of that uh, uh, part of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. And in fact, uh, the last two grant requests we have made to the Department of Energy, uh, elements of those proposals contained a uh, proposal to do uh, site-specific field work, collecting data and that sort of thing. And the Department of Energy recently has limited us to uh, basically reviewing reports and looking over their shoulder in the field. And uh, as a result, the state has been forced uh, recently to file action in court in attempting to uh, get that uh, issue straightened away. The status is right now that we are uh, going to court uh, filing a brief March 5th, looking for some resolution before summer. Lastly, with site-specific concerns, there seems to be two or three areas that have some major concern, and I don't want to go into them in detail other than to list them off for you, and, and some of which we don't have a whole lot of knowledge about, but know that we are concerned about the issue the unsaturated zone and the lack of understanding about how it relates to the saturated zone, how it relates to containment and isolation are, are large questions that I don't think the uh, Department of Energy has resolved and uh, needs some additional attention. Additionally, the area of faulting, volcanism, groundwater transport time, the relationship of the aquifer under Yucca Mountain to the regional system, the mineral potential of Yucca Mountain and the surrounding area, the thermal effects in terms of the uh, uh, stability of the host uh, rock and uh, the breakdown of the potential zeolites are all concerns that I think need additional attention. On the institutional side, the land withdrawal question is still is a, is a major issue. We still see unresolved concerns in the area of tourism, economic development, and transportation, as I mentioned. I guess lastly, There has been a lot of talk recently about number of jobs from this sort of project. I know recently, as, as, as recent as yesterday, uh, uh, Mrs. Vukanovich had made some statements about 8,500 jobs that appear in the environmental assessment. Looking at those numbers, it seems to me that they are largely, uh, at least somewhat inflated, uh, based on two or three conditions. <laughs> One is that that 8,500 uh, number of jobs contains a 40% contingency uh, it also is calculated, uh, calculations include vacation and sick pay expressed in terms of number of man years. Um, net effect could be uh, as much as another 15% increase. And uh, thirdly, that they include the secondary workers, of course, the 1.4% multiplier. And I guess lastly, in looking at the projections that have occurred in previous projects, in the WIP facility in New Mexico, uh, those, those uh, employment projections have been off as much as 50% as we've been going down the road uh, in that project there. I guess in a nutshell, that's essentially what I, I wanted to deliver to you tonight. I'm somewhat apologetic about not going into more of these issues in depth, uh, but I thought we'd try to deal with some of those in question format. Bob? <coughs> Well, first of all, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this forum on. It's one of the few opportunities that people in this part of the state will have to listen to a variety of viewpoints on this critical issue. And I think it's also heartening to see a, a good turnout here tonight because um, it's something that uh, Nevadans from all walks of life from all over the state should be taking an interest in. Citizen Alert was founded in 1975 in response to citizen concerns about nuclear waste dumping in Nevada. Since then, we've branched off to a variety of energy, environment, and public lands issues, but s still retain a lot of the concerns about nuclear waste that we voiced in the mid-70s. Our primary objectives are to educate Nevadans on public policy issues and to encourage Nevadans to take part in decisions that, that will affect Nevada, and this decision certainly will affect Nevada. We're opposed to the nuclear waste repository at Yucca Mountain for a variety of reasons. We've studied the issue for the last 10 years, 
and remain unconvinced that the, situ that the solution proposed is safe technically sound or equitable. Uh, during the 50s and 60s, Nevadans were told by the forerunner of the, one of the forerunners of the Department of Energy, the Atomic Energy Commission, that the above ground bombs test posed no hazards to public health and safety. But since then, hundreds of downwind residents have suffered from premature mortalities, cancers, and birth defects. So for one thing, it, it's not it's unfair for the federal government or the Department of Energy to ask Nevadans to stand aside and let them proceed with this next nuclear gamble. And it is a gamble because as we've been told we're talking about 10,000 years as a conservative estimate that these wastes have to remain isolated from the human environment or from the environment itself. 10,000 years. In the last 10,000 years we saw a major ice age and it's, um, it's going to be pretty tough to, to determine what other, geolo what other natural occurrences can happen in the next 10,000 years that would make the repository leak radioactivity. The environmental assessment states that earthquakes near Yucca Mountain should uh, be considered as possible. And I think that's a very uh, a, a good admission. I th in, the, in the past, the, er the area around Yucca Mountain has been subjected to a number of naturally occurring earthquakes in addition to the hundreds of man-made earthquakes from the detonation of nuclear weapons. These um, blasts above 100 kilotons underneath the ground have been known to cause structural and architectural damage to nearby communities. It's um, the, the ju in judging by the rise in the military budget it's likely that the, de that the Department of Energy will increase the frequency of these tests, and it's also likely that this could significantly disturb the geology of Yucca Mountain in the future. What should be of concern to all Nevada residents is the transportation issue. Now, this issue literally drives the nuclear waste issue home, or right next to home almost, for, for a lot of people who are going to live along those routes. Um, the environmental assessment says that two million shipments of radioactive waste occur annually in the United States, and it has a little reference to that. But uh, what it doesn't say is that fewer than 100 of those shipments are high-level nuclear waste, the kind of nuclear waste that we're talking about, the spent nuclear fuel that would, is destined for the first nuclear repository. Um, the, the Oak Ridge National Laboratories uh, has calculated that by the year 2004, there would be 9,000 shipments that would arrive in 2004 to a western repository, which would be Yucca Mountain. So we're talking about fewer than 100 shipments per year this year to 9,000 shipments in the year 2004, which is only 20 years away. And as the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists pointed out, in an article last summer, with that vast increase in the number of high-level spent fuel transportation, it's not a question of whether there's going to be an accident, it's a question of when there's going to be an accident. Um, just by way of the, the, the Three Mile Island catastrophe was supposed to have happened only once in 30,000 years. It happened in the first year, that, and, and that shows that uh, Accidents not only can happen, but they probably will happen, and we've got to deal with those things in a, in a worst-case scenario. One issue that hasn't been receiving enough attention, in my opinion, is that the land of Yucca Mountain is on sacred lands claimed by the Western Shoshone people. The 1863 Treaty of Ruby Valley gave the United States government the right to pass through Shoshone lands, and in fact, the Shoshone even gave them uh, mining rights and things like that for the early settlers. But the treaty never did relinquish title to the land. And this is why the Western Shoshone Nation claims that this land still belongs to them. The U.S. Supreme Court heard the case in October, and they're expected to issue a decision later on this year. And from, the, from some opinions that there's a good chance that uh, the Supreme Court will decide in the Shoshone Indians' favor, and it's no secret that they're not too hip on nuclear waste. And the fact that um, 
this uh, case has not even been considered in this environmental assessment doesn't do justice to the Western Shoshone people. And as the, 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 there has been a lot of talk about jobs, there's been um, the, the first figures that, that I saw claimed between three and five thousand workers. Uh, last June, those were trimmed to one to two thousand workers, and now um, and the environmental assessment states during the initial five-year phase of construction, there will be between 2,800 and 3,350 jobs needed for that five-year period, which, and I use that because it's the most labor-intensive period. So with all these figures being tossed around, I think it's, uh, it's, it's safe to say that the Department of Energy doesn't have a foggiest idea about how many jobs are going to be produced. As, 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 as Bob Lex stated, there's the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico. The final environmental impact statement for that stated that between 1,200 and 1,300 workers would be needed for that. Well, today, under peak construction, there's a labor force of 672. So it's, no, um, it's nothing new for these employment figures to be inflated as a little carrot to hold in front of um, communities and as a way to uh, say this is the kind of economic manna from heaven that, that these communities need to keep going and to grow and things like that. Um, one, one thing that I also want to point out is that there is a danger to Nevada if we go on record supporting things like nuclear waste dumping in the state. Uh, we, we could very well become the target for other kinds of garbage that other states don't want. The nuclear power plants themselves have to be decommissioned after about a 30-year period. And once uh, Nevada goes on record as, ex as accepting high-level spent fuel, well, why not, you know, the tons of radioactive garbage that comes from nuclear power plants? I mean, we already have the nuclear waste anyway. Uh, uranium mill tailings are doing all kinds of environmental damage in the Southwest. They have to be moved someplace. You know, why not, why not a few uranium mill tailings? The, um, also, the, the EPA has identified you know, s several Superfund sites in which the toxic waste there have to be moved someplace. Well, Nevada's are, you know, if Nevada gets a reputation of accepting nuclear waste, why not, you know, why not throw in a few toxic wastes on top of that? It's just a, uh, a, a tip of the iceberg, and I think that it would perpetuate the idea that Nevada is a vast desert wasteland good for nuclear waste dumping, a few toxic wastes, and, and little else. Now, I, I hope that I've kind of, that I have made the point that there's a lot of unknowns about this project, that there's, um, that there are geological concerns about earthquakes that could possibly happen. There's, there, there, there's problems with the, with, with, we're not sure that the Hydrology down at Yucca Mountain will be the same in a thousand or ten thousand years as it is today, and there, we're not sure that there will be a, won't be a transportation accident in the state. So, after sixty after about sixty years, once the once the waste repository is um, has received the waste and it's ready to be decommissioned, the surface facilities will be demolished and there will be. The, sh the shafts will be sealed, among other things that go along with de the decommissioning of the, of the site. And then we're going to have to sit back and hope that nothing happens for the next 10,000 years that's going to let that highly dangerous radioactive material get out into the environment. It's, um, it, it's a long time to expect civilization and even language itself to remain as we know it. In fact, no, no human institution has ever lasted that long. So to kind of get around this and let, um, let people know if, if the language changes or if human institutions do change, if our government happens to change within that time frame, the Department of Energy commissioned an archaeologist to come up with a way to mark the site as a dangerous area in a way that could withstand changes in human institutions. So this archaeologist designed a 25-foot 20 20 high pyramid shape object on one side, it says, radioactive waste, do not dig deeply here, in the five languages of the United Nations. On the other side, it says, it gives a brief description of the site. 
And then on the third side, it, it, it says a number of things, but concludes, do not destroy this marker, but replace it by using long-lasting materials and languages common in your own time. Now, I, I just say this because I think it gives an idea, a good picture of the time frame that we're talking about. And, and if the geology, hydrology, or other technical factors change and the radioactivity is released into the environment, you know, maybe it's a closed basin, but there's still people down there. And I don't think it's fair for our generation to go ahead and put that kind of a burden on future generations anywhere, in Nevada or anywhere. And in my opinion, I think this whole program is ripping off the future for the sake of the present. When when Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, they intended that the most technically safe site would be chosen to become the nation's first nuclear waste repository, not the weakest state politically. I think politics was a key factor in choosing the Hanford and the Yucca Mountain sites. Hanford is already dedicated to nuclear activities and is on lands already owned by the Department of Energy, and Yucca Mountain is partially owned by the Department of Energy and near lands contaminated by radioactivity. We've heard from a number of legislators in this state recently that Yucca Mountain is probably a good site because the land there is not any good for anything else, presumably because it's radioactive. You know, why, why would they want to send workers in there and to work on it then? That's not the point, but the point is that it's not on the Nevada test site. Only a fraction of that is on the test site. So we're talking about taking a big chunk of land in Nevada that's not radioactive and, and sealing it off and presumably making that radioactive again, making it radioactive. Um, I think it's also curious that the department is not investigating sites for the first round in the eastern states, sites which, which have rock types equivalent to or more stable than those sites being investigated in the west. And I think the answer is, is because they have a hell of a lot more political clout than states like Nevada and Washington does. And, and finally, if the program is as safe as we've been led to believe, then why does the department want to ship these wastes thousands of miles to underpopulated areas in the west? Citizen Alert thinks that this waste solution should be so safe that the users and the utilities of nuclear power could live safely and comfortably around that site. And until this nuclear waste problem is solved, and we have an agreed upon method of solving these, of solving the nuclear waste problem, the waste should not be produced. It's irresponsible and not to, not to uh, discount the seriousness of it, it's kind of like building a house but not putting any bathrooms in it. Um, that's a joke anyway. Okay. Uh, so to conclude, I'd like to, uh, as I said, one of our goals is to encourage public participation in nuclear waste decisions and, or in, in public policy decisions, and nuclear waste is, is one of those decisions that uh, we should take part in. So what can we do to stop this nuclear waste dump? As I said before, it's going to be critical that Nevadans from all walks of life from throughout the state get involved in this, write to their elected officials, write to letters to their local papers and sit, get the word out that you know the people are speaking and we do not want this nuclear waste dump shoved down our throats. There's also the hearing that's coming up in, in late the 28th of February. And it's going to be important to get people out there to express their concerns. More importantly, we should get our comments down in writing and submit them to the Department of Energy as presumably those would get more attention than oral comments would at the, at the hearing itself. I think also we should push for an extension on the deadline. We only have a 90-day deadline, a 90-day comment period, which runs out the first part of March. And this is a significant document, and I think we should get a lot more time to comment on this. So write to the Department of Energy and write to your congressional officials and ask them to extend this deadline. And finally, one thing that you can do if you are interested in trying to stop this nuclear waste dump from being put in Nevada is to support organizations in the state that are also trying to stop it. One of those organizations is Citizen Alert. There's plenty of, there's a couple pamphlets over there on the table that kind of describes our organization. I 
invite you to pick them up afterward, take them home and read them. If you have any questions, give us a call. There's also some bumper stickers over there and it doesn't hurt to let other people know how that there are a lot of people in Nevada who, who don't want this in and this bumper sticker kind of gives that impression. Um, again, thanks a lot for coming and uh, let us know if you have any questions. We'll be available right here, right now. And also our phone number is on, the, is on those pamphlets. So give us a call. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Those are very concise and informative presentations. Um, who wants to start with a question? Thank you. The League of Women Voters is very much interested in getting uh, other individuals to uh, comment on the environmental assessment and uh, to make their comments known in writing. Um, I'm wondering if each of you could give suggestions to people in the audience as to how to go about reviewing this environmental assessment. I don't know which one of you might want to start first. John? I, I hate to be overly simplistic, but um, it's a document that has to be read. If you want to comment on it, you must read it. People wanted a great deal of information in there. Um, when Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, it specified that this document had to be written and it said that there were six major topics that it had to cover. And so we've tried to address those six major topics. Um, I can't think of any other, you know, way of um, reviewing it other than to systematically read the document and find out what you are pleased with or what you're unhappy with. Also, I, I think that's a good question and that um, Citizen Alert is having a meeting a week from tonight at the Reno YWCA at 7 o'clock in the evening to go over this document and to highlight some key issues in it that people might want to comment on. And so I would urge you to attend that. Well, I think one of the important things would be to get a hold of it, first of all. Uh, there are uh, thousands of copies practically at my office at this point. We've got a multitude, so if anyone wants one, uh, be sure and get a hold of me. I'm sure that there's also a toll-free line that there's been some availability of the document f uh, from, and I think it's getting better. So I think the first thing is to get to it. The second might be to... Uh, oh, my number is 885-3744. Uh, we're on the second floor of the Capitol. If you call and give me your mailing address, I'd be happy to get it out to you. As I said, I have about 50 or 60 copies I'd be happy to cut loose with. I think in looking at the document, it might be important to uh, go through it initially with, with some thoughts in mind in terms of how you're going to uh, uh, prepare comments and look at talking about issues. It might be helpful to talk about general impressions, first of all, general concerns, uh, general uh, statements and then go back through and try to identify specific areas where there's concerns, specific uh, 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 places where you might be able to document where that is in the document by a page a paragraph reference in order to support some of your general concerns. At least in looking at it, that's uh, the, uh, the approach that we've been taking in, in the way that other state agencies have looked at it or, or beginning to look at it. Uh, at this point in time, there's about eight or ten uh, state agencies right now who are, are evaluating it um, here in town and, and throughout the state uh, uh, in Reno and Las Vegas. We have uh, today have written to the, uh, the head of the nuclear waste office in Washington and asked for an additional 60 days uh, to review the document, essentially extending the comment period out to May 20th. Although we haven't gotten any written confirmation of that, uh, we should hear one way or another in the next couple weeks about that. And if that gets extended, I'm sure the department will do a public announcement about that. So there is some efforts underway to extend the comment period currently. There was a question in the very back. Well, well, I think we share that viewpoint, and we, I believe, advertised in the Sunday newspaper. I didn't bring the list of all the newspapers that we've advertised in, 
and that there will be additional advertisements in the newspaper and on television or on radio. I assume that it should be, should be in every local newspaper. Okay, that's a point, but we haven't advertised in every newspaper in the state. I can send you the list of newspapers that we had advertised in if you, you want. But we've picked um, maybe uh, nine of them in southern Nevada and nine of them in northern Nevada. Yes, sir. What are other nations doing with their nuclear waste? Is there anything to be learned from their experience? I think that uh, there is uh, things to be learned from that. Other nations, um, such as Germany, uh, France, England, Sweden are all going about it the same way the United States is, that is geologic disposal. The United States is in possibly better shape than they have because there is more land and more geologic formations from which to pick. Um, Germany is looking at disposing of it in salt formations. Uh, France in uh, either granite or some of the clays. England is still has not picked a geologic formation. Sweden is looking in granite. So basically, the concept is to um, use geologic disposal. But none of them have initiated it or actually done it there in the study stage also? Well, they're still in the, the sites or process of picking sites. The foreign country that's furthest along is Germany. And so they've picked a site at Gorleben, which is on the border between East and West Germany. Uh, they have a salt formation, and they've already started, um, I believe, constructing shaft. Chapter 6 is that chapter which compares the site against the siting guidelines. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act required the department publish siting guidelines. Um, they are now issued as a uh, federal regulation. Its number is 10 CFR 960 and Chapter 6 compares the site against those and has qualifying conditions favorably or uh, potentially favorable conditions, potentially adverse conditions, and then disqualifying conditions. And chapter six is basically the analysis of the site against those siting guidelines. So chapter six deals specifically with the other That's correct. To the other chapter, mm -hmm. other That's correct. Yes, yeah, in the third row. Oh, it's you, Mark. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I must say, I'm, I'm still astounded by the fact that um, the Western Shoshone uh, claim for land is not addressed. And uh, I don't even think it's been adequately addressed by the governor's office, quite frankly. Um, this is a case of international importance which receives stress attention all over the world, hardly ever receives any attention at all. However, it still astounds me that this is a sovereign nation which uh, has claimed, has made claim to this land in the United States Supreme Court and has not addressed in that document. Could you speak to that please? Yes, I can. Uh, there are varying viewpoints about that claim. You represent one viewpoint. The Department of Justice and the federal government has a different viewpoint. Uh, I believe the Shoshone claim has been before the um, Supreme Court twice before and has been denied. Uh, we just have another avenue that they have chosen to bring it back before them. And so, the, while I am not a lawyer, I've had the lawyers explain to me the situation. And um, it's not clear whether or not the Supreme Court will, will find in their favor this time. And, but in the previous two times, the Supreme Court has not found in their favor. That's not quite true. Well, I mean, there's, like I say, there's different viewpoints. And I, what I've done is consulted with my lawyer. I am not a lawyer. I'm doing the best I can to explain law. I'm an engineer. And so, um, we know that the Supreme Court has reversed itself in the past. If the re Supreme Court reverses itself, and the Department of Justice has to take a new viewpoint, the federal government as a whole has to take a new viewpoint. I am not an independent agent within the federal government. And so I still have to live by the constructs and the policies of the federal government in executing the, this part of the job. And that's one of them that is still, and the Depart federal government's viewpoint is still 
established by the previous two cases. Um, ten years ago, a document about that size was withdrawn um, because it presented uh, insufficient information for both the public and the federal government to come to a clear decision about nuclear waste disposal. Um, many of the issues that I gather are not addressed in this document were uh, raised at that point, uh, having to do with Shoshone land claims, having to do with compatibility or incompatibility with underground testing at the Nevada test site. Um, I'm wondering if you could do a sort of compare and contrast of this document with its predecessor for us so that we can understand how the government has attempted to rectify the errors of the okay. last decade. I think that the, the document you're referring to was the environmental impact statement that was put out on a uh, facility called the RSSF, the Retrievable Surface Storage Facility. Now, it did not, it was not withdrawn because it begged the issues in terms of certain substantive things with regard to the site. The EPA uh, pointed out the fact that we were talking about temporarily storing waste in a surface facility for a period of time up to 300 years. And that document did not deal with the final disposal of the high-level waste. And so on the basis of the fact that it did not deal with what this document is dealing with, the disposal of it, it was for that reason alone that it was withdrawn. At that time, the policy of the government changed. If you go back in history, from 1957, based upon the recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences, Geologic disposal. Time, and between '73 and '75, that was the position of the federal government. The environmental impact statement was put out. When it was found to be wanting for that one particular reason, it was withdrawn, and the policy went back to geologic disposal. The federal government, the agencies of it had said, this is not an acceptable answer. What you have to do is define a way for the permanent disposal of it. And so in 1976, that's when large sums of money finally began to be made available to research this issue and come to a conclusion. The questions that were made at that time were valid and, and continue to be valid in my mind, uh, particularly the question that Bob raised about compatibility with underground testing. And I'm, I'm wondering how the decision was made not to address that question in Chapter 4. I can't recall exactly where that's identified or dealt with in Chapter 6. But the fact is that we do not view that there is a significant compatibility problem with regard to the major activity that's going on the test site in this particular thing. People have, I think, an unrealistic fear of the fact that when ground motion is produced by some event, either it being natural or man-made, that significant negative things are going to happen. I mean, I can go into the tunnels where we've done testing, and 2,000 feet away, a nuclear weapon has been detonated, and all that tunnel complex is still there. And those tunnel complexes, one of them has been there for over 20 years. And so we're not exactly sure to help um, is people. We have considered earthquakes, and the question is, from what point of view does it cause significant detriment to the isolation of the waste? And what people have failed to do is to look at what is the phenomenological mechanism, that is, what are the kinds of things that can happen as a result of ground motion in terms of loss of the capability of isolating the waste. And so we hear a lot of comments about ground motion and earthquakes and those things, but people are not able to identify the physical changes that occur in the earth where the waste is located that would cause it to come out of the ground. And so. I mean, that is one of the major concerns we have, is how do you keep this stuff there for that long period of time? 
I mean, I have no interest in terms of selling a temporary disposal site in terms of 30 years uh, for the disposal of this thing and have it fail. That is not our intention. I understand that, but I'm confused that you're saying both that earthquakes, considering earthquakes and figuring out what they may or may not do is important to you. Right. And at the same time, you say, but we don't need to look at the compatibility with underground tissue. I didn't say that we didn't need to look at it. I said we've looked at it. We've looked at it, and we do not understand, you know, why there is such a um, uneasiness about it. We've looked at the physical things that can happen as a result of that, and have not been able to identify how physically radioactive waste can get out of the ground as a result of those effects. Now we're perfectly open if somebody can can show us in hard descriptions of what's going to happen. We have no problem with addressing them. It's probably because we don't understand the process of the storage in the first place. How is it stored? What? Why is it safe for earthquakes? How, how would it leak if it were to leak on Okay. Um, let me start out first of all. This question about the term leak, you know, words are very colorful things. And leak re always implies either like a leak from a tire, which means gas is coming out, air or leak from a tank, that is, like liquids are coming out. The point is, the most significant thing is, we've converted the waste into a solid. And I have a hard time thinking of a, of a solid putting on this table, leaking through the table and coming out the bottom. I don't know how that can happen. Now, we know that if there's water that comes in contact with it, even glass, things that are normally considered stable within our lifetime, over millions of years will eventually dissolve in water if you put enough water on it. So we know that that's a, we have to look at the water, how much is there. Now we know we're going to first of all start out with this waste, the solid. And it will be put in a hole in the ground in a repository. There will be a bunch of, I wish I brought my slides, but a bunch of tunnels that are dug and holes put in the floor maybe every 10 or 15 feet. And a big can of waste, maybe a, a foot in diameter and 10 foot long, would be placed in that hole and that would be covered over so the radiation, uh, like x-rays, could not harm the workers that are working in the facility. And there it will sit as a waste. A can of radioactive material will sit there in that solid rock for a very long period of time, hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. And unless something unusual comes along, the fact that you see this waste in the ground, and it's in a hole, and an earthquake happens and it shakes it a little bit, the question is, what, what's going to happen to it? It can't fall out the bottom because there's rock underneath of it, thousands of feet of rock. So it's going to sit there in that waste. The, the question is, would the earthquake somehow perturb the water table? How much water is present? And we have not seen those things. There was a point made earlier about you know, we don't know what the water table looked like 10,000 years ago. That's an incorrect statement. We do have what are known as paleohydrologic studies. That mean paleo means history, uh, the um, historical studies of the hydrology. And the water tables that we've seen have risen and up and down over that period of time, but not to a point where it could come back into the repository. So we do have some understanding of the fact that there will be this solid there once it's converted into solid, it's not going to go back to liquids or gases on its own. It's going to stay right there in that, that opening. When we back out of the repository, we'll, we'll backfill all the tunnels. All the rock that was mined out of it will be ground up and packed in with some other material and seal the repository back up. So there's no way that that solid material can get out. Don, is it, you talked earlier about it would be a stable solid. And is it fuel rods or is it reprocessed material? Well, there, there's two forms. One is it should be the spent fuel elements, which are basically pellets of uranium oxide, which is a ceramic, uh, placed inside of metal tubes made out of an alloy called zircaloy, which is very stable in the kind of environment that we're looking at. And then it would be put inside of a metal container. In our particular case, we would expect something like stainless steel. And so that's the nature of the, the package that would go into the, the hole. So it's solid, 
I've used the term glass because we could have processed waste or we will either have spent fuel elements which are basically zircon or uranium oxide. Let me say, let me answer that question in two parts. The first part is, if we go with the sites that we're looking at, the amount of information we have about the sites say that at least one of the five that would be nominated would be capable, and we would expect all, all five of them being capable of serving as a site for a repository. But must that be so? Um, there is still some question in the lawyers whether or not you have to have three of them available at the end of site characterization or whether or not two of them could rest. But we expect that there will be three at the end of that site characterization process. Now, we believe all three sites that would be recommended are technically capable of isolating the waste. Now, there is a process put forth by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act that says the governor of the state and the one that is eventually recommended by the president to Congress can veto that. Now, Congress was aware that nobody would be overjoyed with the idea of having the repository in their state. And so they gave the, the governor the opportunity to veto it, and if he could make a case that something drastically was wrong, that they would sustain that. They might sustain it for other reasons. But it also gives Congress the opportunity to override that veto, but it requires a simple majority in both houses of Congress to override that. Now, if for the reason that a site is not picked because a governor has vetoed it, then it is required that the Department of Energy recommend within one more year one of the other sites. And so there's always this question of can the Congress afford of after spending somewhere in the neighborhood of $750 million to a $1 billion characterizing a site, and that there are no substantial technical problems with it, that they can afford to have it vetoed. Now, the, the second part of your question was, what, I, it slipped my mind. Well, if I, was, I was hoping for a possibility that if, if the, there was no approvable spot. Oh, the, 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 the industry. Yeah, there was something uh, a couple of years ago called the confidence rulemaking. Um, I think NRDC or one of those organizations brought suit against the Nuclear Regulatory Commission saying they could not license another repository unless they had confidence that disposal of high-level waste would occur. And there was a big, thick set of documents written and a lot of hearings held called the confidence rulemaking hearings. And based upon those um, rulemaking, the NRC found that they had confidence that disposal would occur before the year 2000, and therefore they could c continue on. If for some reason, uh, there became a major hiatus in the process of identifying sites, say in 1990 or 1991, uh, somebody might go back into court and reopen that case, and this time uh, the courts and the commission might not find um, favorably in that. In that case, no new sites would be licensed, and I do not know whether or not they would discontinue operation of the reactors that were already operating. But there is a potential for that. No, that, that's incorrect. Basically, if we look at the projections for all the nuclear reactors that have existed and will exist by the year 2000, and assume that those reactors operate for 40 years, they will generate around 140,000 metric tons of spent fuel. That's enough spent fuel to fill two repositories, assuming about a 70,000 metric ton. So the first repository site will be picked, and it will be filled with 70,000 metric tons. It cannot be filled with more than that until the second repository site is identified. If the second repository site is identified, then it can get 70,000 metric tons, and that would accommodate what we would project would be generated through the year 2040 based upon all reactors that were built by the year 2000. So there would only be two sites picked 
and they would operate for a 30-year period of time, maybe stay open for a couple more years to make sure everything was going okay, then they could be decommissioned and sealed. Frankly, I mean, you know, you're not talking about many years. You're talking about the stability of this area in terms of tens of thousands of years, and we're talking about 30 years, and you're going to seal it up. We're talking about 30 years and the length of time it would take to fill the repository. The geologic record says that this area has been stable, no major loss of surface, and so on, for a very long period of time. We know Yucca Mountain has been in place for about 12 million years as it currently stands. I mean, there are other places we know that geologic formations, such as salt formations, salt which is soluble in water and can be carried away, have been in place for 450 million years. So the thought of that being there another 10,000 years is not a very difficult thing for me to conjure up in my mind. And so that's why people believe that the Earth was the best place to put it. There have been periods of stability for that. No, it isn't at all. I'm just saying that, you know, that may be true. It may be very stable. I don't know. But if we're going to continue producing nuclear waste at the rate we're producing it, we are going to need many, many more sites at, that are this stable. Now, when you say many, many more, what's many, many more? Well, uh, Ten? Years, you're talking about a drop in that. I mean, you know, a bucket is just a small amount of time. One can imagine that maybe, depending upon how long nuclear power goes, maybe 10 or 12 repositories. To me, that's not a significant amount in terms of the land mass of the United States. How do you come up with that figure of 12 repositories? Do you feel we're going to move into other fuel sources? Is there some you know, fusion is still an option in terms of making it work. I mean, it's going to take us more than 50 years to be able to overcome some of the engineering problems in that area, but there are, will have to be other other resources. I'm wondering, um, anybody in this room and any of you there, especially any of the advocates of this project, could be willing to be one of those three people who projects it to die of cancer as a result of testing the show? <laughs> I'll be a martyr. Uh, let, let me put it in perspective. Um, what was the little town over in Utah we saw at Christmas time that had its disaster? I mean, people accept risk in society every day. We kill. Most people willingly accepted the risk of being a minor. Right. And there are other, you know, social things like every year we electrocute 3,000 people. Do we eliminate electricity because of the social benefit that would come to those 3,000 people? I mean, uh, we've put in electricity in the United States because of its general good, the overall good that it has. Um, but 3,000 people every year get electrocuted. Now, if we would use your logic that we would not have a repository and transport the waste to it for the benefit of the, the society, uh, one would have to argue, too, that we would discontinue operating electrical plants because there are far more people electrocuted in one year by a factor of a thousand than is projected in latent cancers under the worst conditions. You're not hearing what I'm saying. I, I think I am hearing no, what you're saying. I asked you if you'd be willing to die of cancer. Willingly take that risk. I will take the risk, yes. Will you, be, are you, will you willingly die of cancer? No, I say I will take the risk. I'll be willing to stand along the roadside and be exposed as those trucks go by. Remember, the three cancers assumes that the one person stands 100 feet from the highway for all 183,000 trucks that go by. That's got to be somebody. That's got to be somebody. And so we're saying under those worst conditions, I don't know whether or not I can live for 30 years standing out in front of all those okay. trucks. And so I'm willing to take the risk. Now, you have to give me that you can't say you will take the risk, but you will be the one out of that population. I will stand there with the rest of the people and take that exposure. Mr. Five feet. Veith. Right. German pronunciation is Veith. Uh, you mentioned that you were an engineer. Yes, sir. May I inquire as to what field of engineering? Metallurgical engineering. Metallurgical engineering. Because you have some background in these work and things of that sort of route that you're using. Okay. Uh, I've been serving on a national advisory committee in Washington. 
and we had people from the Department of Energy testify before us. One of our considerations was uh, whether or not to put any nuclear submarines in high level uh, materials such as we're discussing here in the ocean. A very difficult problem. We submitted a report. And uh, several points came up to the physicists who testified before us for the Department of Energy. I think the Department of Energy is uh, responsible to inform the public, as you are doing tonight and trying to, uh, of the problems that we face as humanity and civilization. But so much of their talk, when you try to get down, is never down to the human level. For instance, uh, in one occasion, one of the physicists testified to us about some problem in uh, nuclear reactors, the radiation was only so many lens or, or carries uh, times, let us say, 1.3 times 10 to the minus 17. Now that's ridiculous. It has no meaning. How many people in this audience here have any idea what I'm talking about when I say 1.3 times 10 to the minus 17 throughout downtown? It's been so long since I myself have played with mathematics like that that I'm not even exactly sure what we mean by it. And it was suggested that we use some very common, usable, things to people, and, and I myself suggested they could create a flyer. Uh, I heard a geologist, uh, a good physicist, not working for the Department of, Inter uh, of Energy, and a public relations journalist who write some simple flyers and send them out. Now, I could ask this audience here, how many of you people have blown up the Lake Tahoe and sat on those rocks, or granite rocks, on the eastern shore, with your family, having a picnic, and viewed the mountains, not flat and the beauty of Lake Tahoe during the summer. I'm sure some of you have done that. Oh, right there you are. And the young lady asked about giving cancer. If she sat there long enough, her chances of getting cancer over a period of time are greater than those trucks passing her 180 feet away on the highway. And why can't you give the public that like that? There are radioactive minerals in every granite. Humanity developed, evolved <coughs> on the Earth. The Earth has had natural radiation since it began 20 million years ago. And all life has been subjected to radiation. You go to a church built in granite, and you sit along the granite walls for an hour, and you have radon coming out of you at you from those granite walls. You are getting radiation when you go to church. It's all around us. It's in here now. Red bricks have a certain amount of it, very minor. I think the Department of Energy is losing a chance, Mr. Fee, in, in the simple comparisons. If you go to St. John's of the Vine in New York, it's made of Poughkeepsie granite in New York. And you think, well, this is fine, I'm going to go to church and worship. But you are also getting radiation. And it's all around. So I think we need some comparisons that people can understand to help bring the point. Now, we're going to end up with some place to deposit this material. And I realize that we yet don't know whether we're going to end up with fusion or not. But I don't think we're going to run out of uranium, particularly if we get the greater reactors. We're not going to run out of uranium in the next 60 years, so we've got to come up, as this young lady wishes to know, with more places to deposit the high level material. So I have all kinds of offer this suggestion to you to carry it back. I talked to one of your physicists from down at the in the Albuquerque area, you know, where they're, they're working. And he agreed with many of these discussions, but he says he's unable to get these ideas forth to the top of the people who will underwrite a public fire of this sort. And the point is, Mr. B, that much of the public do not view a high level credibility in what they're being told. And I think the Department of Energy would be wise to hire people who do not work for them to tell these plain stories to them. The point is very well taken. Whether or not we can remember all the examples that you've cited is, um, is a difficult thing. Yes. Whether or not we can hire, we've tried to uh, get people to provide the kinds of things that you've talked about, including the one put out by the League of Women Voters called a nuclear waste primer. We've tried to get people to help write different viewpoints of those things. Um, we've done, I think, is best we can under certain things, that, you know, restraints that the federal government operates under. 
uh, your point is not uh, not overlooked. I think you also bring up a good point, and this is something that the Nuclear Waste Policy Act uh, and Congress have pinpointed. Everybody's pinpointed it, but everybody dances around it, and that's the perception of safety. There is the the idea that as long that, that the goal, and in fact, on the back of the of the nuclear waste perimeter, is um, a statement by the League of Women Voters that says that it is as important to to have the public believe that this is a safe process as it is to actually be a safe process because of the tremendous amount of doubt that um, the Department of Energy has been under because of its history of being the Atomic Energy Commission. And what we're dealing with, and but that's a very um, reversible kind of thing. What is perception versus what is public education? And um, one of the things that I've become convinced of over my years of being involved in, in uh, public issues is that the more opportunities that there are for interactions such as this, for public participation, for talking about the issues um, with all the parties present, the, the, more, the more you get a clear picture of what is really going on and the public is able to form judgments. And, and the Department of Energy's mission is to act in such a way so that the public regains confidence in the Department of Energy. Um, and in my opinion, that can only be hastened by increased public participation, increased support for organizations like Citizen Alert and the League of Women Voters that are trying to get the word out, um, including financial support, and increased demands by the public for these kinds of things. And the, the public also needs to say, we want answers, as well as, as for, for groups to say, we would like you to, to come to our meeting. Um, I think I'm going to stop the meeting now. We're getting pretty close to the time, um, to the time that the library will start stirring in and asking if we're done. And that'll give you individually time to chat with our panelists if you have individual questions. Um, Abby, I'd just like and sort of wrap up if you would uh, sure. to to thank the league for hosting this. I think it's 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 been a uh, uh, it's a good idea to to get these things out. I guess. Uh, additionally, I, 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 at the same time, would like to uh, offer some apologies. I'm, I'm somewhat under the weather this evening, usually a little more animated and uh, uh, talkative than I have been tonight. I hope that when you invite us back to do it again sometime when at least I'm feeling somewhat better. Not a lot of <laughs> well, I come here as a, as a visitor to your place in Carson City here, although I do live in Reno, and I'm a geologist, and the background of some of this material. And you're always interested in hearing opinions. And we've heard opinions from three of the panelists and opinions here. But I'm also a scientist. And I think the, the weakness of a hearing of this sort, and I'm sorry that I have to be semi-critical, is that they are generalized opinions. I think comparative statements would be much better, as I pointed out. Let's hear something about so much radiation against so much radiation in our normal lives. We talk about danger. 